Madam President. Leader. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. <clears throat> First, briefly, Madam President, I'm pleased that Leader Schumer and I were able to reach an agreement on a fair process and estimated timeline for the upcoming Senate trial. This structure has been approved by both former President Trump's legal team and the House managers because it preserves due process and the rights of both sides. It will give senators as jurors ample time to review the case and the arguments that each side will present. On a completely different matter, on Saturday we lost a great statesman and scholar who gave more than 80 of his 100 years to his country. George Shultz's service began in the U.S. Marine Corps. From the beaches of Peleliu, he was among the Americans who helped retake the Pacific from Japan. Back home, he earned a PhD in economics. He taught at MIT and would later helm the University of Chicago's Graduate Business School. But public service beckoned, and George Schultz began a decades-long run of ping-ponging prolific prolifically between academia and top government posts. The first of three presidents who'd benefit from his expert counsel, Dwight Eisenhower, hired him as a senior staff economist back in 1955. A decade and a half later, he was back, this time as President Nixon's Secretary of Labor, where he worked on desegregation and later as OMB director. Then at a pivot, pivotal moment for the U.S. and world economies, George Shultz was tapped to lead the Treasury Department. He fought inflation and worked to modernize our monetary policy so American leaders could control America's destiny. After an interlude in the private sector, Secretary Schultz's country came calling again. He spent six and a half of President Reagan's eight years as Secretary of State. He helped steer the smart and strong foreign policy that clinched the free world's victory over the Soviet Union. But even as the Reagan administration nudged communism into a box canyon, this top diplomat's master touch was vital in making sure that tensions did not rise too high. As amazing as it sounds, this impressive resume doesn't fully explain George Shultz's incredible reputation. It wasn't just all he did, it was how he did it. He led with thoughtfulness, fairness, and above all, integrity. He lived by the maximum he shared in his centennial reflection just a few weeks ago. Here's what he said, trust is the coin of the realm. His honesty and thoughtfulness won wide admiration that transcended politics. He won the trust of career diplomats and State Department staff, including those who did not naturally lean to the Reagan right. Famously, when new ambassadors met with him on their way abroad, the secretary would spin a globe and ask them to point out their country. The unlucky ones who fell for the trap and pointed to their foreign destination were swiftly, swiftly corrected. No, he said, your country is always America. At the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville, we host a distinguished speaker series. George Schultz honored us as the very first ever distinguished speaker back in 1993. And he kept right on writing and speaking and mentoring young people up until just a few weeks ago. America was his country, all right. He loved it deeply and served it always. The Senate's prayers are with the Schultz family and all their friends and colleagues he leaves behind. A truly remarkable life. In 2020, a Republican Senate and a Republican administration led five historic pandemic rescue packages on a completely bipartisan basis. <clears throat> we marshaled the largest federal response to any crisis since World War II, about $4 trillion across five bills, all of it completely bipartisan. But now Washington Democrats have other ideas, even though we are still pushing out $900 billion in relief that Congress passed less than two months ago. 
even though a group of Senate Republicans met with President Biden to discuss bipartisan avenues for hundreds of billions of dollars more, Washington Democrats have decided they want to go it alone. It was last March, remember, when a senior House Democrat called this disaster, quote, a tremendous opportunity to restructure things to fit our vision. Americans are suffering, but their side seems to see an opportunity to ram through ideological change. That's the impulse behind Democrats' latest $1.9 trillion proposal. Their plan for more massive borrowing puts left-wing myths ahead of scientific evidence and the nation's urgent needs. While the Biden administration's own scientists say schools could reopen safely right now with smart and simple precautions, their proposal buys into the myth from big labor that schools should stay shut a whole lot longer. While Republicans want to save as many jobs as possible, Washington Democrats are backing Senator Sanders' demand to move to double the minimum wage. The Congressional Budget Office says this would kill 1.4 million American jobs. Nonpartisan experts say it would send more people to the unemployment line than it would lift out of poverty. But remember, this is all about liberal dreams, not urgent needs. Some Democrats even want to break Senate rules to jam this through. Last week, the Senate had a 14-hour voting marathon on amendments to the phony partisan budget that Democrats jammed through as a procedural first step. We got Senator's own record on a host of questions that matter to American families. Sadly, Democrats blocked our efforts to say that at the very least, the very least, school districts where teachers have been vaccinated certainly need to reopen, to press states to accurately report nursing home deaths, to protect the free exercise of religion, and several more. Other amendments divided Democrats and were adopted. For example, over some Democrats' objection, the Senate said illegal immigrants should not receive stimulus checks, that the Keystone XL pipeline should not be canceled, and that our government should not declare war on fracking. But, amazingly enough, at the end of the night, the very same Senate Democrats who sought to appear moderate by supporting these three things turned around and voted in lockstep to strip them all out again. Our colleagues who said they supported these changes voted to strip them right back out at the end of the evening. That's about as Washington, D.C. as it gets. For the sake of America's kids, America's jobs, America's health, Democrats should put the political games aside and resume the same kinds of bipartisan talks they demanded constantly all of last year. American families deserve a process and a bill that puts their actual needs at the center. Now, Madam President, on one final matter. Over the weekend, hundreds of thousands of protesters stood up across Burma in defiance of the military coup. For a week now, the military has detained hundreds of civil society leaders and Democratic elected officials, some on mysterious or obviously specious charges, and others without any charge at all. Their actions were illegitimate right from the start. And the treatment of these political prisoners is showing the world of the military regime's disdain for the rule of law. In the face of this tyranny and with the memory of how brutally the military has dealt with protesters in the past, the public unity of so many of Burma's people is a powerful display of courage. In far-flung cities and towns, members of the country's diverse ethnic groups, from the Burman majority to the Shan and Rohingya minorities, have rallied around the democratically elected government. They are demanding justice and an end to military rule. I've been encouraged over the past week by the diplomatic efforts undertaken by the administration to demonstrate the United States' condemnation of the military's flagrant assault on political rights. Today, it's time to follow up with meaningful cost on those who aid and abet the suffocation of Burmese democracy. The people of Burma in the streets today are putting their lives on the line. As one protester told the New York Times over the weekend, I don't care if they shoot because under the military, our lives 
will be dead anyway. Today, these protesters are joining in the same refrain heard repeatedly in places like Hong Kong, where democratic progress is too often met with jackboots. They're standing up for basic freedoms, and they're paying close attention to who will stand with them. Yes, they have to go on. Paul Rule. 